Welcome traders to this week's live market analysis and trade analysis session with me, Patrick Munley. We're going to get started here in just 30 seconds. Okay, that is 1 p.m. British summertime. Before we get going, as always, want to adhere to the risk disclaimer. And most pertinent to today's presentation, the views and opinions expressed by me are solely mine. They are not indicative or representative of those held by Ticknell UK or Ticknell Europe Limited. And just before we get going here, if you can hear me and you can see my screen, could you just type a Y in the chat box so that I know we are good to go? <clears throat> Testing audio, one, two, three. Testing audio, one, two, three. If you can type a Y in the chat box, if you can hear me and you can see the screen. Excellent, thanks very much, okay. So for those of you who are here for the first time, a brief introduction uh, to myself. Uh, like I said, my name is Patrick Munley and after I graduated from university, I joined a City PLC consulting firm. I left with some colleagues and went on to successfully co-found and exit a consulting startup, which was focused on C-suite executive search for technology businesses. I essentially had a front row seat to the dot-com bubble, witnessing people make and lose a fortune in the market, sometimes quite literally overnight. So I decided to explore my curiosity for markets. With some capital to play with and some time on my hands, I started day trading the S&P 500, or probably more appropriately at that stage, day gambling. After some early beginner's luck, I racked up some pretty solid gains. However, as is often the case, my beginner's luck ran out and as the market phase changed, I began to average down into losing positions, giving back all my gains and ultimately experiencing a significant six-figure hit to my capital. To say this was a gut-wrenching and sobering experience is an understatement. I really had to stand back and figure out if it was feasible for me to make a living from the market. So I decided to get serious about trading and sought out a mentor with an excellent trading track record. Working with my mentor for a period of 18 months to two years was a time during which I, not just my technical gain in terms of researching, developing, and extensively back and forward testing strategies that crucially suited my personality, all of which were underpinned by a rigorous risk management approach. But most importantly, during the period of mentorship, I significantly developed my mental game. And probably most importantly of all, I made the watershed shift from being a highly goal-orientated individual focused on financial gains to becoming purely process-orientated. So what does that mean? Well, it means I had to stop focusing on what I could make from the markets and start focusing solely on managing my mindset to allow me to consistently execute my trading strategy, oftentimes in the face of negative feedback from the markets in the form of losing trades. But once you become process orientated and have a professional trading mindset and you understand the true nature of trading, uh, being a numbers game in which you're simply playing the probabilities, you lose the emotional investment and that hellish emotional roller coaster of living and dying by the outcomes of individual trades. So I'm no longer concerned with the outcomes of individual trades or even a small string of trades. My focus is on the next 100 trades. because so I know if I focus on excellence in execution, my edge will demonstrate itself over an extended series of outcomes. My multi-strategy approach has delivered profitable annual returns since 2008. Since 2013, I've also been managing investor capital through a managed account service, again, delivering annual positive returns. And I'm currently responsible for managing a multi-million dollar portfolio. Since 2010, I've mentored hundreds of private traders of all experience levels, from complete novices to former CME floor traders in developing the technical and mental skills to reap consistent returns from the markets. In addition to my fund management and mentoring, I am a resident market expert exclusively providing market and trade analysis to Ticknell clients. I provide an in-depth daily market outlook, breaking down the fundamental and technical drivers for the day ahead. I also provide daily technical trade setup videos, uh, which are shared through the Ticknell Trading View accounts. And 
I'll put the link for that account into the chat for those of you who want to follow along with those, uh, those daily trade setups. I also run uh, Ticknell's rapidly growing e-mini strategy group, where I post a daily trade plan outlining my pre-market strategy for the cash trading session in New York for the S&P 500 or the e-mini S&P 500 futures. I give my bias for the trading day ahead and specific action areas where I'm looking to engage the market. These pre-market plans have delivered over 4,000 points of profit since we launched the group over a year ago. Second Ticknell strategy group I run is for traders who really want to take their trading to the next level. The Ticknell Futures Trading Telegram group is a real-time environment. On a daily basis, I share in-depth insights, analysis, and real-time trades. I also provide live commentary during the opening hour of the New York Cash Session, where traders can essentially see in real time how I dissect the markets and identify asymmetric trading opportunities. These sessions act as a platform helping you to develop a professional, consistent approach to navigating the markets, and most importantly, the mental mind games that must be mastered to make it as a profitable market operator. Okay, so that gives you a flavor of where it is I'm coming from. Let's, uh, let's jump into today's charts. But before I do, I'm just gonna post the link for the uh, futures group there, the Facebook group, you just request access and you'll get access to my daily trade plan for the S&P. 500. Okay, so to the charts. Um, before I get going here, I've got a bunch of charts that I want to look through and give my view on. If I don't cover a chart that you would like me to take a look at, if you post that uh, into the chat, then at the end of the session, I'll, uh, I'll pull that up and, and give you a view on the chart. Uh, and also, if you have any other questions, just drop those into the chat box. And again, at the end of the session, I'll come back to them and, uh, and cover them all off in a brief Q&A once, uh, once I've finished my presentation. So let's start with the S&P 500 using the e-mini futures contract. Uh, we broke down through trend uh, channel support after that horrific CPI print. And we have uh, we've basically traded into the resistance zone. I highlighted this level on uh, on Monday uh, through that uh, through the Ticknell TradingView account, looking at this 39.30 to 39.40 area. So this prior basically trend line support to act as resistance, which it did. Uh, we saw a pretty decent uh, sell off yesterday from that similar level. 39.25 was the high yesterday, and we are now down into the trend channel support here. Uh, obviously, the sell-off yesterday prompted by a, uh, a pretty hawkish read from the markets in terms of uh, the FOMC raised by another 75 basis points. But I think the market was most spooked by the idea that uh, Powell is really sticking to his guns now and, uh, and is prepared for um, Main Street, so to speak, as opposed to Wall Street, to take some pain in terms of a, a potential recession doesn't appear at this stage that he's going to back down. And so uh, the market took a pretty uh, glum read on that and we saw a decent sell-off. So what I'm watching today is potential support zone here, interim support. I'm not suggesting this is going to be uh, a tradable, uh, sorry, and, and, you know, the low of the, the move, but I think we could see some support into this 37.20 here. We have this, uh, this low volume node weekly projected range support. So 37.10, 37.20 is going to be a key area I'll be watching today on the intraday charts, where I think we could see a, a bounce and certainly think about a move back up into this 38.30 area. But ultimately, whilst we hold below this trend line, uh, this is the weekly trend line support back from the March uh, pandemic lows. Whilst we hold below there, I think the June lows are certainly vulnerable. Um, but I would anticipate that we would at least see a tradable bounce from that 37.20, 37.10 area. Um, at this stage, until we can reclaim uh, 39.50 on the upside, uh, it's very difficult to get constructive uh, for further upside at the moment. Moving to the NASDAQ. So similar setup here, I've got uh, an equality objective versus this swing structure here. So from that swing high at uh, 12,970, 
we have a downside target here of 12, uh, sorry, 11,200. And that would basically take us back into those June lows. From there, I think we can see a bounce. Certainly, we can think about this high volume load getting retested from below, <coughs> just below the 12,000 level. And above there, we have uh, the trend channel resistance. But again, similar to the, the S&P scenario at this stage, unless we can reclaim uh, 12,200 on a closing basis, I think pressure remains to the downside. And we could actually be looking at, uh, at a breach of the June lows. And if we do, the downside target that I'm going to be paying very close attention to is the 10,540 to 10,340. Uh, one is the 131 extension of this swing high from the uh, 15,285. We also have the 61.8% retracement of the post-pandemic advance. And that would, uh, that would be an interesting area to watch. Again, uh, not necessarily talking about the, uh, the low for this move, but certainly I think we could see a, a pretty decent bounce from that area. So I'll be paying close attention to to any move into that support zone. Dow Jones. <clears throat> so the Dow has actually taken out now the weekly trend line support on the closing basis. So it's going to be important to pay attention to the weekly close on the Dow, because if we close below that trend line support, I think we can be thinking about any bounces after that as, uh, as opportunities to fade, uh, looking then for the downside equality objective versus the swing structure here, 34,300. For those of you here for the first time, let me just tell you what I mean by equality. So when I'm talking about equality, I'm talking about the length of this swing from the swing high projected forward to give us a potential swing low. So that's what I mean. Anytime I'm referring to equality objectives on any time frame, that's what I'm talking about. Now, interestingly, this equality objective, the 27,119, uh, is just below the 50% retracement, 12, uh, 12, uh, 27,498. So where we get these retracement and extension confluences, they're often uh, interesting areas to pay attention to uh, for responses from uh, price action. So that's the, uh, the downside objective. If we get a weekly close at or below current levels, I think uh, any bounces are there to be sold and we target a move down into this 27,000 area. Russell, <coughs> Russell has, uh, is sitting just at its weekly quality objective. Uh, sorry, the weekly trend line support, uh, just above it at the moment. I'm looking for a break here now to give us a target down into 15,700, uh, sorry, 1,579, which is the quality objective versus this swing structure here. And if we pull up the FIB retracement tool, let's see if we've got any confluence there. <clears throat> So just below, we have the 61.8% retracement of our uh, pandemic move. So initially, what I'm looking at for the Russell is I would anticipate we have an equality objective here on the daily time frame within this channel, gives us 1674. I'd be looking then for any bounces back into trend channel resistance as an opportunity to fade. And then we're targeting a move down to that 1579. So any bounces from the 1674 back into trend channel resistance, 1780s, we watch for bearish reversal patterns to engage on the short side. And we will be targeting then that move down into the 1579 area below. DAX. <coughs> DAX also sitting close uh, or sitting on a ledge basically here. Um, as I talked last week, any close for me through this uh, 12,380 area, I'm going to be looking to get short the DAX, targeting a move down to uh, 11,150, which is the equality objective versus this bigger swing structure here. And we also have that 61.8% retracement and the yearly S3 just below. So uh, paying close attention to any break of that support area, let's just lower this line here, any break of that support area. And what I've been watching for is that first move and that first pullback into 
uh, that prior support zone to act as resistance. So we get that extension to the downside in terms of the DAX. All right, let's take a look at the dollar. This is a trade I've got on as of this morning. Uh, sold the dollar index at 11, uh, 111.50s um, and shared that with the, uh, the guys in the trading room this morning. So that's running about 100 points of profit at the moment. It's the only trade I've actually got on in the book right now. Uh, so I'm looking for us to extend to the downside here, initially targeting a move into the weekly projected range support. So that comes in uh, 109. And then from there, I'd be anticipating the potential for a bounce. And on the intraday time frame, I'd be looking on the hourly, the four hour chart for a three wave corrective move uh, back into this uh, 11070s. And from there, I'm looking for a price to roll over and looking the main target for this move anyway to start with is going to be this 10660s. So um, this morning, risk uh, 50 points on the upside or 50 pips and uh, the potential trade uh, could see a 500 point move to the downside. So 10 to one play here if, uh, if it plays out as I anticipate. And this, this setup really, um, a couple of things have driven this. Uh, firstly, uh, we're gonna talk about this in a minute, the, the BOJ obviously intervened in the markets today and, uh, and we'll talk about that, the effectiveness of that move. But more importantly to me, it's that idea of uh, buy the rumor, sell the fact scenario plays out over and over again in the markets where uh, the markets anticipate like we had. There was a high level of anticipation regarding a 75 basis point move or even a 100 basis point move by uh, the FOMC. And so the market ran, ran the dollar up into that. And then we traded into this resistance area that I talked about, the 111.50s, 111.80s. And, uh, and we've seen a nice reaction from there. Note, most importantly, as I talk about this every week in terms of fading these trend moves, got to have this, got to have momentum divergence. For me, that's the critical component to fading trends because what's that telling you? Well, it's telling you that the rate of change, so the rate of increase in price is slowing meaningfully. So that means it's taking more energy within the market to achieve higher prices than it was in prior phases of the trends. And that's the first sign or the first component or constituent of the opportunity to fade trend moves. Otherwise, you always want to be trading ideally with the trends. Um, but in terms of if you are thinking about fading the move and you have a target area that's predefined uh, for, the, for you guys that are here week in, week out, you'll know I've been watching this level. Uh, firstly, it was the 11030, which I traded, uh, took some profits out of that. And then we looked for that uh, 111.50 this week, and that, uh, that trade is underway at the moment. Gold. This is what I'm watching tonight. Certainly, this is, uh, this is uh, to my mind, is uh, potentially very interesting trade. So what are we looking at? Well, we have this uh, major swing structure, thinking in terms of the quality objective again. So this swing here equal to that swing from this swing high gives us 1663. Uh, now, to my mind, it's no coincidence that we have traded that level to the tick. We traded it last week and we saw profit taking on the first move. We've retested it now and we're seeing a nice reaction. On the daily time frame here, we also had uh, an internal uh, swing structure. So from this swing high into this swing low, from that swing high, that also gave us 16.70 as a down, as a target area. So I talked about this area last week, and we're now starting to uh, see some uh, developing uh, demand come into the market. And importantly, what we have is this momentum divergence. So again, what does that? That's the, the key component, and now it's starting to be backed up by the price action. So a decent reaction yesterday, obviously a bit whippy because of the, um, the FOMC, but today, if we get a close, bullish close back up towards the highs there, so into that 1690 area, coming into the session tomorrow morning, the London session, um, you can be looking at on the hourly charts, look for an overnight pullback, and then look for that breakthrough as we head into London or the New York session tomorrow. So I'm. this is a trade I'm really uh, 
mindful of and watching, especially if we can keep that pressure on the dollar. So dollar weakness should, uh, should see this gold trade potentially develop. So I'm going to be looking to play a break of that pivot. So through 1700, that sets up for tomorrow. I'm going to be long gold and my first target on the upside is going to be back into this high volume mode, 1805 and range resistance just above at 1820. Copper is another one I'm watching here. Uh, obviously, it's been through a phase of uh, significant weakness driven by lack of demand, obviously. But we're starting to see the potential here for a corrective move. So we're sitting at this trend line support. So if we can close at or above current levels, I'm going to be looking for a break of the pivot there through 3.5465. And what's my first objective going to be? Well, it's going to be the equality objective. So I've marked it on here, A, B, C, equal legs, which will take us back into the daily trend line from the high. So we're looking then for a test of 3.9975 in terms of copper. Let's check in with Bitcoin here. Still seeing weakness, as most of you will know who are here on a weekly basis. I'm not going to be doing anything until we test this 12. Uh, 12,185, which is this big equality objective, ABC pattern to complete. And uh, we are bouncing a little bit here, but uh, let's just see what we have. So we have this trend channel at the moment. Obviously, we broke down through that prior support area. And then that. We're looking for this trend channel to be maintained. So look for resistance into 21,500. And again, watching for shorting opportunities to the downside in terms of Bitcoin. Uh, Ten-year note, so obviously interest rate sensitive products. Uh, we are looking for a five-wave sequence to complete into the 127 extension of this last corrective wave. Now, obviously, for those... Uh, who are uh, Elliott Wave uh, enthusiasts. Um, you can see a three-wave corrective move here. This wave is impulsive. So what we'd be anticipating here is that once we test that one 2 seven extension, if we can maintain some momentum divergence here, then we look for a three-wave corrective move, which ideally would take us back into this high volume area, 119. Um, and if we look at the 10-year yield, so obviously yield moves inversely to price, and uh, what we're looking at here is the 127 extension. Let's draw this in. It's our last corrective phase. And we are trading just below. So let me just remove that and give you this. So we're going to say that uh, wave one, two, we're looking for a three. Ideally, we retest, hold these prior highs, and then get a fifth wave extension up into 3.76. And then from there, we'll be looking for another corrective move to develop, ideally in three waves back into the apex here at uh, just about 3%. That's what I'm watching there. Uh, let's take a look at the dollar yen. So we have the BOJ selling dollars this morning. Uh, to support the yen. And this, this weekly close here, let me just get rid of all these drawings for now. Watch this weekly candle, because if we can get a close at or below current levels, then I think this sets up for uh, an opportunity next week to, uh, to sell the first corrective phase on an intraday time frame. Let's, let me just pull up an hourly chart here and I'll show you what I'm talking about when I, I'm referencing that. Reset this. So, what we'd be looking for ideally is a, a strong, an impulse move down, and we then look for a three wave corrected move. And then we'd be looking to sell that for at least an, e an equality objective to the downside. So when I talk about those retracements heading into next week, uh, if we can finish on the weak side, we're looking for that three-wave corrected move uh, against this, uh, this weekly close. See, we've got some nice tails there, three of them 
142.87. As long as we don't get a close above there, then next week I think there's going to be a decent opportunity to sell this yen, uh, sell the dollar yen, sorry. And what we'd be looking at will be a three wave move that takes us back down into uh, the 135, 134.50 area uh, before we once again try to rally. But uh, that's going to be a trade for me heading into next week. The euro moving inversely. Obviously, to the dollar, uh, it was looking uh, looking pretty bullish this morning, but we started to roll over a bit here. The area I'm paying most attention to, and I've talked about this relentlessly, is this 97.60 area. If we can get a test in there, a uh, the bullish reversal pattern, maintain momentum divergence, then I think there's an opportunity to uh, to play a counter trend rally in terms of the euro today. If we can get a close back above uh, 99.70. So bullish outside reversal pattern. And again, tomorrow I'd be looking at an opportunity on the long side in terms of the Euro uh, and that dollar index play obviously would, uh, would work well with that. Sterling, we have tested that 112.50 target, We're finding some buyers at the moment. I need to see a close back through uh, 113.90 to look tomorrow morning on the intraday timeframes for a, uh, a long trade to basically take out this wedge, three-wave corrective move. I think we could trade back to uh, the 117.30s. So round out here with the Antipodeans. So we have tested that uh, the 66.40, that's the long-awaited equality objective. I'm trying to put in a reversal here on the, uh, the daily time frame. I'd want to see a close back up through uh, 66.90 to, uh, to get interested tomorrow morning on the interstate time frame, looking for a long position. And uh, we think about a test into the high volume node and the trend line resistance at the 60, uh, 69.30s. Let's take a look at the key. This is the other one that was of interest to me. So we're testing this uh, trend channel support. We've got some nice momentum divergence. So when you close back through the 59 level today, would, for, to my mind, be an opportunity on the long side to play a, a counter trend uh, rally and uh, certainly think about a retest of this weekly uh, trend line support then to act as resistance 6120s. Right. So, anything else I'm immediately looking at here? Let's take a look. Euro yen. Watch any test here into the trend line support. Uh, two ways of playing this. So, we either test and reverse or we break. And if we do, then the first target on the downside is going to be a move to 133.40s. And then this is a pattern that uh, I really like. So if we get in here, a small bounce and then break, we get down to here, and then we get a three-way corrective move that puts us back into uh, this 39, uh, 140 area. I'd be looking at a fade there, and I think we can trade down 125 on the downside in terms of uh, the euro yen got a big uh, weekly trend line support coming in 130. So there's an opportunity developing in the euro yen if we take out this trend line. That's why I flagged that to uh, to highlight that today. Okay, so that's uh, the whistle stop tour this week of the charts that I'm watching. I think there's a bunch of opportunity uh, developing here. What a couple of things to be mindful of uh, as we head into the back end of September now and thinking about October. Uh, September has been, is notoriously a seasonally weak period for uh, risk assets, so the equity indexes, etc. Uh, but as we head into October, that, uh, that seasonality starts to shift. And importantly, what you want to remember is that we are then heading into a period where focus is going to start to shift from, uh, from central banks, so to speak. We've had nine central banks this week. We've seen some big rate rises, of, often can be a pivotal period. But we are then starting to shift focus to the US and most importantly, uh, the midterm elections. And as I've stated before, you can see some surprises in terms of um, data and, uh, and focus in the markets as we head into those elections as the incumbent party seeks to retain control. So just a, a sentiment factor to, uh, to bear in mind as we head, uh, head out of September and into October, and then into those November midterm elections. Okay, so are there any questions?
you have a chart you want me to take a look at, I haven't covered, uh, just post that into the chat or any other question you may have. There aren't any questions. Uh, I'm going to um, take that as I've done a reasonable job of explaining my, uh, my views of the markets uh, for this week. And I'm going to wrap the session up. Uh, I've posted the links in there for the trading view uh, to follow along with those daily trade setups. And you can just request access to the futures group to get my daily uh, trade plan for the S&P 500 or the e-mini S&P 500 futures contracts. Okay, guys, I'm going to wrap this session up here. As always, traders, plan the trade, trade the plan, and most importantly, manage your risk. Until next week, thanks very much.